Y'all get ready. Yes, you get ready. This news in the streets. Join us, sentiment, mother T. Breaking news with integrity. So, sir, your friends and your family. It's the lovely T TV show. Bringing you good tea and good vibes. It's the lovely T TV show. Be sure to share, like, and subscribe. Tony, you said last week at the news conference that you would begin filing lawsuits as early as this week. Um, do you have? plans to do so, um, and do they involve celebrities? Do they involve just Diddy, people beyond Diddy? I think I'll let the lawsuits speak for themselves. Uh, I don't expect there to be anything, you know, everyone's focused on what's, what other celebrities were involved, um, you know, who's going to be named, who's going to be outed. I don't expect that to happen this week. Uh, I'm hoping to file some lawsuits this week. Uh, we'll, they, of course, will include uh, Mr. Combs and some corporate entities. Uh, but we want to make sure that that you know if we name individuals uh, beyond Mr. Combs that that we make sure that we've done our homework because it's going to create a firestorm. We understand that, so uh, we're going to make sure that we dot our eyes and cross our T's. Uh, Tony, you said something interesting there. You said I don't expect that to happen this week. So that sounds like there could be other people named, uh, other famous people named down the road. I know you said this is going to be a process over the next 30 days of filing these lawsuits. So are you saying not this week, but maybe in the weeks coming after this one? I would expect so. I, I really don't want to get in, in into a situation where people are, you know, if, if I don't file a lawsuit next week, then, you know, there's a, a that creates a media frenzy. The, the truth is, I, I want to be clear about something. Um, if you were attending one of these parties, if you will, and you attended attended before or you knew what was going to happen. That is, um, you knew that a particular drug was being used in drinks that was causing people uh, to be coerced and taken advantage of, and you were there in the room or you participated or you watched it happen and didn't say anything or you helped cover it up. Uh, in my view, you have a problem. And uh, as we file each one of these cases, we're going to make an effort to resolve them on the front end. But failing that, uh, we're going to file public lawsuits and pursue these cases aggressively. So uh, who will be named, when they will be named, all that will come out in due course. But the bottom line is, you know, I, I want to be clear about the scope of this. A lot of people attended these parties. A lot of people saw this activity going on. A lot of people uh, allowed it to go on, said nothing, didn't intervene, maybe benefited from it, profited from it. Uh, all of these individuals and entities, in my view, have exposure here. Are we talking about celebrities on the level of Diddy? I would expect so, yes. Have you sent any demand letters out to anybody other than Diddy saying, um, here's what you've done, we want to settle with you or we're going to file a lawsuit. Have you sent any to, say, other celebrities beyond Diddy? We have. And I want to, I want to explain that process because it's important. You know, in every single case, especially cases like this, uh, we collect our data, collect our evidence, do our due diligence, spend time with the victim. And then uh, because it's in the best interest of the victim, uh, we attempt to resolve these matters without the filing of a public lawsuit. And we have done that already. Uh, we've done that, I would say, you know, with a handful of individuals, uh, many of which you've heard of before, and we'll continue to do that. Uh, that's just the standard process that every lawyer in the United States who handles these types of cases uses because it's, it's, it's the right way to do it. But there are also people who want to jump on the gravy train and want to make money. And that's got to be a big slice of what you're getting. I mean, it's not just automatically believing somebody because they say it. No, I think, Harvey, I think you're right. You know, I was born at night, but I wasn't born last night. Um, you know, you get 3,200 calls and that turns into 100 some odd clients. I think you see the process that we're involved in. We're doing a lot of vetting, a lot of due diligence. These demand letters are not unique to Diddy. This has been going on for a long time, right? This is part of a strategy and there's clearly a PR and a communications 
way of going about this that's tied into what they want to be both the legal and the financial outcome. So it's not an accident. And I agree with the assertion that the time for leverage is before the unnamed celebrities are outed or their names are become public, even if they're just allegations. So it seems pretty clear to me that this whole ro rollout of the press strategy is meant to support and to they're using the media as a tool and seizing on the fact that the allegations are so incredibly salacious and disturbing. And it's it's a lot to take in. Let's just say you know, you received the letter, but then the lawsuit comes out and it's still anonymous. You're named as celebrity one or celebrity two. What's your response at this point? The best possible outcome is to avoid being named and to avoid having your brand connected with P. Diddy's because his at this point is completely toxic. I don't think there's any scenario under the sun under which he comes back from this. So if you have the opportunity to settle this and to keep your name out of the headlines, that would be the course that I would advise and I think most celebrity clients would prefer. It's a money game when it comes to civil, and that's why the plaintiff's lawyers are saying, hey, you settle now or we'll litigate later. And I mean, it's pretty simple what the celebrity is going to do, right? Absolutely. It's, it's reputational dynamite. You talk about whatever sort of goodwill you've built up from the public, whatever your brand equity is, just being blown to bits just in the release of your name as it relates to this. So this is undoubtedly an attempt by the lawyers on the plaintiff's side to try to get a settlement for their clients. And you know, one of the things that I think we're seeing as a byproduct of everything involving Diddy is you have allegations coming out of the woodwork against a whole range of celebs at this point, many of which are trying to tie the target of their lawsuit to the behavior of Diddy, which which I think there's a, a fundamental difference between someone who's been indicted on multiple counts and is currently being imprisoned versus someone for whom there's just an allegation. But again, you do not want your name, you do not want your brand connected the, to this in any way, shape, or form. And if there's an exit ramp that involves writing a check, you can rest assured a lot of people are gonna choose that route. It must panic a lot of people in Hollywood that they may play these videos in open court. And even if a celebrity isn't engaging in the Criminal misconduct activity. that they're alleging against Diddy, just being there um, in the middle of what they're seeing. Talk about collateral damage. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 it's gonna be devastating. When you're talking about allegations involving drugging and raping men and women, this is the most toxic stuff imaginable. And so I'm not surprised that no one wants to be connected to this. I think we have not yet seen the other shoe drop. My prediction is you're gonna see a lot of celebrities who, even though they're doing the best that they can to avoid this topic, ultimately there are gonna be other people named, even if they just were there, present, not necessarily that they engaged in any alleged conversation or the alleged actions. Just wait, there's gonna be a lot more to come on this topic. You guys are gonna be very busy for a long time, I suspect. Hey, tea sippers happy Monday. I hope everybody's doing good. I hope you guys had a blessed weekend. So it is a lot going on. Like I've been telling y'all, this whole Diddy situation is definitely a Dragon Ball T, okay? It's no different than when I was covering the R. Kelly case. It seems like every other week there's a new lawsuit. These lawyers are keeping their damn feet on Diddy's neck. It is insane. You guys just heard the last lawyer come out in that TMZ interview, and he said, you know, basically Diddy is toxic right now. A lot of celebrities are running scared. Even today was announced that um, Liam from One Direction was found with pink cocaine in his system. This morning we are getting a glimpse at what authorities in Argentina believe contributed to his death. Sources tell ABC News multiple substances were found in Payne's system, including pink cocaine, a popular but potentially dangerous party drug, cocaine, benzodiazepine, and crack. An improvised aluminum pipe to ingest was also found in his hotel room. His body will remain in Argentina until the autopsy, autopsy is 
was complete. The night of Payne's death, hotel officials called authorities to report that he was behaving erratically. He tragically plunged to his death from a balcony. Payne had been open about his struggle with substances in the past. This morning, his legions of fans are remembering him as a vibrant entertainer. He leaves behind so many loved ones, including a young son, Robin. And we all know pink cocaine, a.k.a. Tusi, was something that was mentioned in the Diddy lawsuit, Little Rod, that he was a pink cocaine dealer along with, you know, Madam Carisha, that they were, you know, pushing it and carrying it for him. So it's very interesting that that was what was found in his system. So now, if you guys do not know, Tony Busby has come out and he has stated that they have been five new lawsuits filed and many more to come. With those lawsuits, they're also calling out Diddy and other celebrities. They have not mentioned the celebrities' names yet. Those names may come out, but as of now, they're not being mentioned because I'm sure they're waiting for those celebrities to play smart and prefer to pay out the victims rather than be named in this craziness. So I wanted to wait until I could have access to the court paperwork. Y'all know me, I like receipts. I don't necessarily just want to read these serious, you know, accusations via a blog. So I was waiting for the court documents to drop and I finally have access to them. I'm not going to read all five cases I was able to access for. The most important one that I needed to access and, you know, fully read through myself was the case concerning the 13-year-old who was 13 back in the 2000s. She's now about 37 years old, but she's talking about her assault that took place where Diddy basically aired her after a VMA um, performance. So let's go ahead and get into these court documents I have on my Mother Goose glasses so we're going to go ahead and get into it right now. Now, this case, um, I'm going to read the one about the 13-year-old last, just to make that clear. So we're going to start with the factual allegations. Basically, everything before line 35 is them suing Diddy, Bad Boys Entertainment, you know, the whole spiel. So I don't want to go through that again. So we're going to start from line 35 in this particular lawsuit. Um, so they're saying here, Defendant Sean Combs' infamous Las Vegas parties were legendary known events for the exclusivity, extravagance, and celebrity guest list. These high-profile parties attracted A-list celebrities from across the entertainment, fashion, and business worlds. The events were lavishly decorated, featured live music performances, boasted top-tier food and beverages. The atmosphere at these parties was one of opulence and luxury, often making headlines for their celebrities for their celebrity guest list, over-the-top entertainment, and stunning aesthetics of the event. Many unsuspecting individuals were recruited to attend these parties. Some individuals were recruited in various cities and were paid to fly in to attend these functions. On Memorial Day weekend of 2014, plaintiff and two of her friends visited Las Vegas to stay at the Rio Hotel. While there, the paint while there, the plaintiff contacted various people she'd met in the entertainment industry in order to find out if any cool events would be taking place. One such contact was an entertainer who identified himself as International Smooth, who plaintiff had met a few years prior at a party in Miami. Plaintiff was never able to assert his legal name, but connected with him through Instagram using the moniker. Plaintiff discovered that Smooth was in Las Vegas through his Instagram stories, and after contacting him, discovered that he worked for Combs as a party promoter. Smooth invited the plaintiff to an exclusive party at Las Vegas' popular poolside lounge called Club Rehab. Smooth made it clear that it was an exclusive celebrity party, and the plaintiff's two friends were not invited, only the plaintiff. Despite having some awkwardness with the probation, with the prohibition, the plaintiff, with encouragement of her friends, decided to attend the party to potentially network with the influ with influential people there. While at the party, the plaintiff met many celebrities, including Mary J. Blige, Little Kim, Nicki Minaj. She saw more that she did not meet. Plaintiff took pictures or videos with many of these celebrities and posted them on her private Instagram page. The plaintiff was also introduced to Combs, who greeted her and said he hoped she had a lot of fun at the party. Eventually, the party at Club Rehab died down, and the plaintiff was invited by Smooth to an after party at Combs' suite at Planet Hollywood Hotel, where the plaintiff spoke to Combs again, and he directed her to the bar area with tens of dozens of open bottles of his Ciroc-granted vodka. Combs directed plaintiff to grab a bottle and help herself. 
Plaintiff took the videos of Comb at the party and posted them to her Instagram. Stills from the videos are shown below. You guys can see them right here. The plaintiff did what was suggested by Combs and, and took a few sips of what she thought to be vodka from one of the open bottles. But about 40 minutes into having one to two drinks from the Ciroc bottles, the plaintiff began to feel nauseated and dizzy, slowly losing control of her motor functions. This occurred around 8 p.m. in the evening. A photographer of an actual exemplary container used by Combs and his agent slash employees to insert GHB into alcoholic drinks are seen down below. So this is what they would carry the GHB in and they would use this to pour into the bottles. You guys remember Mark Curry saying this on Art of Dialogue, that there were certain bottles that Diddy would direct the girls to go drink and then he would tell the homies, don't touch those bottles. Those are for the girls, these are for us. And we go and get to the VIP, all of these girls come around the VIP, and they just be standing there and like, let me tell you something, man, I'm going to get back with you. We got to rewind this back. We used to go to the, when we go to the club, we used to have these bottles, right? And on this bottle, they'd be, they'd be regular Moet bottles. On them bottles right there, they'd be to have something to make the girls be real, real slippery and all of this kind of stuff. So when you get up, they'd be like, don't touch them bottles right there and only drink them bottles right there. So we already knew what the drill was. You just don't mess with them bottles, right? Then all of the girls is in the club after a while. They all running, look, opening up their mouth like little birds. He just running around just popping pills in their mouth. Pop, pill, 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 pill. And then that was the party. Then they go on to say, the plaintiff informed Smooth that she did not feel well and likely needed to leave the party soon. Smooth directed her into an empty bedroom in the suite and told her to lie down there until she felt better. He told her not to worry about being disturbed because the door would be locked. The next thing the plaintiff recalled is waking up the following morning feeling very groggy and sore. Her entire body hurt and she felt it difficult to move. As soon as she awoke, she saw Combs in the corner of the room, shirtless, yelling loudly with an animation at someone on the phone. He was the only person in the room with her, and it was clear that someone else had been in the bed with her. Out of fear and confusion, the plaintiff remained silent and still until Combs left the room, and she heard the front door to the suite close. The plaintiff eventually got up and realized she was naked and her general soreness was more aggravated in her genital area. The plaintiff was horrified to realize that she had been raped by Combs. She found her belongings, including her dead cell phone, and made her way back to the Rio Hotel where her friends were staying. Upon arriving at the Rio Hotel, the plaintiff's friends were shocked to see to see the state she was in. They tried to help her. The plaintiff indicated that all she wanted to do was shower and rest. The plaintiff ended up sleeping for two entire days after that. She only remembers vague glimpse of her friends trying to wake her up and offer her water. Afterwards, her friends told her that, told her that they did their best to take care of her during this time, but she was largely incoherent. In the aftermath of the assault, the plaintiff struggled with intense emotional pain, mental health issues, feeling disgusted and deeply depressed. The plaintiff had experienced a significant impact in her personal life. She struggles to maintain relationships or be in a party atmosphere due to the assault. Not a day goes by for the plaintiff without thinking of the traumatic incidents. So that was the first lawsuit here um, of the five that came out. And this is really sad. And I can see this taking place in Vegas because I've been to Vegas numerous times. You end up meeting people. You have so many promoters numbers. Like if you go to these party spots like Vegas, Miami, LA, you end up collecting phone numbers of promoters, party promoters. And so when you want to kick it and you're in town, you hit them up. Like, yo, you know, I'm in town. You know what I'm saying? What's cracking this weekend? What parties are popping? And of course, if they feel like you're pretty and you send them, you know, your pictures or whatever, that will depend on the level of party that you can get into. Um, but yeah, it's just, I feel so bad for her because I can definitely see this happening where you hit up these promoters, you think everything's all good and you end up getting yourself trapped in a situation. And I can see her friends saying, yeah, you know, go ahead. That's a big party. You know what I'm saying? If my friend got invited to a party like that and I was young, I wouldn't hate on her. I'd be like, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Go network and let us know how it is. So I can see why her friends were like, you know, encouraging her to go because that's a big deal. And remember back then, 
a lot of us looked, well, not me, but a lot of people looked at Diddy as, you know, you know, a, a, a mogul and a, and a role model and stuff like that. A lot of people did not understand the dark side of Diddy. So I can definitely see a young woman getting caught up in this, you know, going to Vegas and ending up in this type of situation, which is just so unfortunate. And that pink cocaine, that ketamine, I mean, it's enough to like put out a horse. You know what I'm saying? So they don't know how much to necessarily put in these bottles. She was out of it for two days. Like, that is scary. You know, she's very lucky she didn't end up overdosing. So we're going to go ahead. I'm going to read to you guys the next case here. So this is the next document. We're going to start from line 36. And it says here, the plaintiff is a dedicated personal trainer, worked with celebrities and other notable individuals concerning their health and fitness. In or around 2022, a fashion designer whom the plaintiff trained told him that she shared a video showcasing the plaintiff's distinctive workout and exercise with defendant Combs. This fashion designer told the plaintiff that Combs was impressed with the plaintiff's training regimen and wanted to meet the plaintiff and feature him in a video. The fashion designer eventually extended an invitation to the plaintiff for him to attend an exclusive awards show after party in Los Angeles hosted by Combs. The invitation stated a private car would pick the plaintiff up from his residence and escort him to the party. As promised on June 27, 2022, a black Lincoln Navigator arrived to escort the plaintiff to Combs' residence in the Hollywood Hills. When the plaintiff arrived to the party, one of Combs' business associates greeted him at the entrance. This person explained the plaintiff needed an executive non-disclosure agreement as a condition of entry to the party. So basically, they're telling him right off the rip, bruh, you need to sign an NDA. You're not just about to walk in here all laxy daisy, you know, having a good old funky time, you have to send it, you have to sign an NDA, which again is very common when you go to celebrity parties. So then they go on to say this. Combs associate did not provide the plaintiff with a copy of the executed non-disclosure agreement. After signing the agreement, Combs associate then handed the plaintiff a drink, which looked like a typical tequila soda with cranberry juice mixer. Combs associate instructed the plaintiff to drink the beverage as another condition to gain entry into the party. Once inside the residence, a model and current client of the plaintiff greeted him. The plaintiff felt more comfortable and at ease after seeing a familiar face. The plaintiff observed numerous celebrities in attendance at the party, adding to the glamorous yet overwhelming atmosphere. Eventually, a business associate of Combs guided the plaintiff to a large room illuminated with red lights in a smaller room. There, the plaintiff observed approximately a dozen individuals, including several well-known figures who were engaging in group sex activities. Once inside the smaller room, the plaintiff began to feel disoriented, dizzy, and weak, far beyond what he would expect from consuming a single alcoholic beverage. It became clear to him that something was wrong, and he later realized someone had drugged him. Then they go on to show, once again, the GHB container. Then it says, at this moment, realizing his significant impairment, Combs approached the plaintiff, removed his pants, and began performing non-consensual oral sex onto him. Combs then directed the plaintiff to perform oral sex on another individual in the room, known as Celebrity A. Due to the haze of the drugs he had been served, Plaintiff could not resist Combs coercion and ordering. He felt trapped inside his own body, unable to control it or understand what was happening to him. As a result, the plaintiff was forced to perform non-consensual oral sex to Celebrity A. After Celebrity A finished, the individual spit in the plaintiff's mouth. What in the hell is going on here? This is sick. Is it true uh, Diddy gave you oosquash, oosquash? Man, he... He it was it was it was it was a night of 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 great slip and slidedom. We it was a night of great slip and slidedom. Okay, he, he a lot of baby oil. No, 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 a lot of spit. <laughs> oh, a lot of spit. <laughs> a lot of spit. Where I come from, brother. At this point, the drug in the plaintiff's system was progressively hampering his motor skills and memory. The drugs caused him to lose consciousness for a brief period of time, 
While in and out of consciousness, individuals at the parties force plaintiff into sexual acts with both men and women. The plaintiff's physical disposition made it impossible for him to reject their advances or otherwise control his body. These individuals, including Combs, essentially passed the plaintiff's drug body around the party like a favor for their sexual enjoyment. The drugs in the plaintiff's systems ultimately caused him to completely lose consciousness for an extended period of time. The plaintiff does not recall anything after this point. When the plaintiff finally regained consciousness, he found himself outside his apartment, disoriented, without a shirt, without his phone. The plaintiff unaware who took him back to his apartment or how he got there. As a direct result of this traumatic event at Combs' party, the plaintiff suffered several emotional and psychological trauma, financial harm, and significant loss of livelihood. Then they go on to say, by drugging the plaintiff and performing oral sex on him and forcing him to perform oral sex and other sexual acts on others, defendant Combs intentionally harmed plaintiff and did so in a malicious manner. Further, all the defendant's conducts were unwelcomed, yet the defendant persisted in a sexually exploitative behavior. So this is really disturbing. And what I find very interesting is I keep knowing, I keep noticing a red light theme around Diddy. And red lights mean something esoterically. I've seen several videos of Diddy with these red lights. And if you know anything about the dark web, um, they got these things on the dark web called the red rooms. And the red rooms are where they torture people, rape people, kill people. It's really dark, disturbing stuff. And I wonder if Diddy is mirroring the dark web. Even in the lawsuit, Cassie talked about how a lot of the freak-offs took place under a red light. We've seen videos of Meek Mill with Diddy under a red light. Um, a lot of this stuff is not just about sex. It's about a transference and an exchange of energy. What we are reading in this lawsuit are sex rituals. You have a man who's being drugged, he's being passed around between the two genders, being raped. This is so much bigger than sex. This entire situation with Diddy and his deviancy that dates back decades, it's about power, control, and rituals. This is sex magic. I don't care what anybody says. Y'all can say I'm crazy and I'm reaching, but I'm going to show you guys other videos that I've kind of gathered over the past few weeks. I didn't know when I was going to use them, but as I see stuff, I just download it and I'm noticing a red light theme and you'll see these videos and you'll see Diddy and there'll be red lights behind him, red rooms. He's burning sage and you'll see a red room behind him. And he's making sure to hit his crotch area with the sage. It's very, very strange behavior. But I want y'all to go ahead and check out these clips. Uh, yeah, get that thing right. Here we go. The special, the special crown. <laughs> That's my sister Naomi. It's my baby Cassie. It's her birthday today. Happy birthday, Cassie! <laughs> What'd you say? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Oh, yeah. French loves it too. <laughs> According to Cassie's case, she said that the room would always have to be lit red and there will always be people watching. As you see here, someone in the background, not only is she recording on one camera, but there's something over to the right. See how she looks away there and Diddy's focused on this camera here. He's saying something to her, pay attention to that figure by her shoulder in between Cassie and Diddy. There keeps being someone in the background ducking in and out of frame. Diddy is trying to get her to perform for the room. As you've seen there, there was someone in the background again, and they're trying to duck out of the frame. Diddy is going to get frustrated here towards the end because she's still being shy. 
Now to the latest on Diddy's indictment. The embattled music mogul placed on suicide watch at a detention center in New York City. This is where we're hearing from people who say they attended his infamous parties and are not surprised by the allegations against him. Local 10's Andrew Perez joins us live from Miami with the latest. Andrew. We've actually spoken with several people who say, frankly, they're not surprised by any of this. This, as the intention, uh, attention rather, in terms of the investigation, now shifts to some of Diddy's friends and employees. This is Diddy. Like, at a Diddy party, he's always going to be turning up. No like, face, no name. His voice distorted at a fear of retaliation over this. If y'all not at Diddy's house, y'all not nowhere. Ah. He tells us and shows us several elaborate parties thrown by music mogul P. Diddy at his homes in L.A. and Miami Beach. He, too, is in the music biz. We spoke with several others as well, describing 24 hours of partying at a time. Sometimes they provide breakfast in a, a morning, and, and it's like you could chill. I'm just wild on how he's just able to keep all that energy. He just has a lot of energy, like, to be that age and, and to be throwing these parties so frequently. It's all mood, often lighting. Club love seen as themes. We heard about Art Basel and New Year's Eve events. More details coming to light after Diddy's arrest in New York earlier this week. Combs abused and exploited women and other people for years. He remains in federal lockup after two different judges denied him bond over claims of human trafficking, racketeering conspiracy, all tied to, quote, Freak-offs, elaborate sex events he'd organized, allegedly fueled by drugs, blackmail, and violence. The freak-offs sometimes lasted days at a time, involved multiple commercial sex workers. When Combs didn't get his way, he was violent. He's known as the party animal. While he had no first-hand knowledge of these sex events, he says there were often parties within those big parties, private spaces, private after parties. Word had been spreading long before the arrest. There's always two parties. It's the public one that you know about, and then it's a private one. Maybe something like, you know, sometimes it's like the VIP or, or the, like the high-end celebrities, they go in a house. Yeah, that's common knowledge. Can I just tell you, when I, good morning, this is my coffee. When I read the documents for the Diddy lawsuit um, with Little Rod, they were saying that during like the recording of the Love album, allegedly, that Diddy like insisted on there being like a mood, like a love romantic mood at all times while they were recording. And one of the things they were alleging is that there had to be red and purple lighting at all times. And this is like easy to check. Like go on his Instagram, a lot of the videos contain red lighting. But I'm not a regular friend, I'm a nosy friend. So you know, I like, I, I might have recorded a few of them and then turn up the brightness and like change the contrast. And like, I'm just curious, like what's, what's going on? Cause you can't see anything cause the light's so red. Is this Palo Santo? <laughs> cause what? Who's burning that? Did somebody come in and be like, this guy's got a negative vibe. I'm about to burn it and put it right in front of him. <laughs> Did someone do the sweep? Did someone burn it and go around the room and do the sweep? I got so many questions. Did he light it? Did someone else light it? Who purchased it? Is this a regular occurrence? Are they always burning the palo? Really trying to clear that negative energy. Also, did he join Insta in 2020? Because that's as far as his Insta goes back. Anyway, I believed in that stuff until I saw this photo. And now I'm just like, maybe that stuff doesn't work. Now, if you're an avid explorer of the internet or you're familiar with the dark web, you've probably heard of the term red room. But if you haven't, no fear, we're going to talk about it. So what is a red room? A red room is essentially something that is found on the dark web that can only be accessed through a specific browser, usually Tor browsers. And these are essentially live streams of people being tortured. These are supposedly like pay-per-view, so you have to pay to join the live room and pay extra to send in requests for what you want to happen to the victim in the video. Uh, yeah, pretty, pretty horrifying concept. Now, some sources claim that red rooms are very, very difficult to find. And not only that, some of them can only be accessed through link invitation. And people pay like upwards of thousands to be in these red rooms, but obviously not with like dollars, pounds, like with Bitcoin, like online currency. All right, so this next case um, took place in December 2022. The plaintiff, who is a 29-year-old music artist 
who wrote, sang, rapped, and produced music, was invited to a party in New York City hosted by Combs. The plaintiff was invited along with several of her friends, also independent musicians. Upon arrival, the plaintiff observed a large white elegant residence, which stood apart from the other homes in the area and was accessed by a long curved driveway. The house was adorned with lavish decor, featuring a grand entryway, spacious room, large glass tables. Once inside, servers offer plates of food and drink, creating a luxurious and upscale atmosphere. Plaintiffs quickly recognized that various celebrities from the music industry and television, including Combs himself, as plaintiffs mingled with other guests, she noticed the widespread use of drugs, including cocaine, pills, and marijuana. Those employed and working in the conspiracy with Combs pressured all guests to consume the drugs that were being provided and served by the house staff. Plaintiff declined the repeated offers. That evening, plaintiff drank a single glass of wine, consuming no other substances. At some point during that event, the plaintiff was approached by and engaged in a conversation with Combs about her music career. Combs expressed interest in her work, stating his desire to help elevate her career by featuring her on a track. Combs advanced the interaction by inviting the plaintiff to his office and suggesting that they discuss the advancement of her music career in private. After arriving to the office, the plaintiff began feeling disoriented as if she were slipping in and out of consciousness. It became clear to her at this time that she had been drugged. So once again, they're showing the paraphernalia and they're saying due to the effects of her drug drink, Combs raped and sexually assaulted the plaintiff. Plaintiff could not stop him from doing so as if she was trapped inside her body, not participating, not being able to resist. The next thing the plaintiff clearly remembers is waking up around 6 a.m. confused and disoriented and disorientated in the same office where this assault took place. After checking herself, the plaintiff discovered blood on her legs from her vaginal area and bruising on her lips. She also found deep imprints on her arms and wrists, suggesting she had been tied with ropes. Additionally, she felt significant pain and soreness at her vaginal in her vaginal region. Overwhelmed with fear and panic, the plaintiff frantically searched for her belongings, including her phone and clothes, but could not find them. Instead, she discovered a pair of pants, a shirt, and slides. She quickly put them on before trying to escape. The plaintiff eventually left the residence. As a result of this incident, the plaintiff has suffered significant emotional distress, trauma, and continues to deal with the psychological and emotional consequences of the assault. So that was her case there, the 29-year-old. So this is really sad and disturbing as well. So I'm going to read to you guys the final case here. We're going to go from line 28. And so on line 28, it says the defendant's individual does, 1 through 10, are currently unknown celebrities and are persons of interest who enabled and or conspired with the commission of conduct complained of the heroine. As the parties engage in discovery, the plaintiff retains the right to amend the complaint to add these individuals by name. So they're basically saying they don't want to add the names as of yet. So then we're going to go down to line 34 where the factual allegations come in. So they're saying on or around September 7th of 2000, plaintiff then 13 had a friend drop her off at Radio City Music Hall in New York City so she could try to attend the Video Music Awards, the VMAs. The plaintiff arrived at the venue and saw large crowds gathering as artists and entertainers began arriving. As the event began, the crowd moved inside, but the plaintiff, without a ticket, remained outside. Determined to get into an after party, she approached several limousine drivers, attempting to talk her way into the VMAs. One of the limousine drivers she spoke to claimed that he worked for the defendant Combs. He told her that Combs liked younger girls and that she fit what Diddy was looking for, not allowing her into the awards, but inviting her to an after party. The driver instructed the plaintiff to return around 9.30 or 10, promising to take her to the party. Later that evening, the plaintiff excitedly returned to the driver who drove her alone in a black limousine with a black interior. After approximately 20 minutes, the plaintiff arrived at a large white house with a gate U-shaped driveway. 
Once inside, two men asked the plaintiff to sign a non-disclosure agreement, informing her that she could not discuss what happened at the party. She gave them her name and signed the form, but did not receive a copy. Inside the house, the plaintiff recognized many celebrities in what appeared to be a living room. Wait staff carried trays of drinks. Loud music played throughout the house. The plaintiff observed widespread drug use, including marijuana and cocaine. The plaintiff accepted a drink, a reddish yellow mixture that tasted like orange juice, cranberry juice, and something bitter. After drinking just one drink, the plaintiff began to feel woozy, lightheaded, making her need to lie down. Looking for a place to rest, the plaintiff entered what she believed to be an empty bedroom so she could lie down for a moment. She did not lock the door. Soon after, Combs, along with a male and female celebrity, entered the room. Combs aggressively approached the plaintiff with a crazed look in his eyes and grabbed her and said, You are ready to party. Combs then threw the plaintiff towards another male celebrity, Celebrity A, who removed the plaintiff's clothes as she grew more and more disoriented. The plaintiff was held down by Celebrity A, who vaginally raped her while Combs and Celebrity B, a female, watched. Wow, this is sick. After the male celebrity finished, Combs then vaginally raped the plaintiff while Celebrity A and Celebrity B watched. So the first male raped her and basically came then he comes in right behind him this is a ritual i don't care what anybody says this is sick and she i'm sure she clearly looked 13 because most girls back in the 2000s they didn't look as grown as girls look now you know with the heavy makeup and the lace fronts if you look at kids from 2000s they look for the most part, like kids from the 2000s. So he knew this was a young girl. This was a 13-year-old and not like, you know, somebody who was 17 or 18. Not that that even been right because it's still messed up. But they knew this was a baby and a woman is there watching this take place. This is just so evil. Wow. Then they go on to say on line 53, Combs attempted to force the plaintiff to perform oral sex on him, but she resisted by hitting Combs in the neck and he stopped. The plaintiff grabbed her clothes and shoes and left the bedroom, roaming naked throughout the house looking for an exit as the party continued. Wow. Once outside, the plaintiff put her clothes back on and left the scene in the dark. Eventually, the plaintiff reached a gas station. A female clerk noticed her distress and allowed her to use the phone. The plaintiff called her father, admitted that she had lied about her whereabouts, and asked him to pick her up. After the assault, the plaintiff fell into a deep depression, which continues to affect every facet of her life to this day. So, you know, a lot of people are saying, well, where, where were her parents? Why would your 13-year-old just be out and about? Bruh, kids lied all the time. There was no Snapchat to, you know, scout out your child's location. There were no Apple tags. Kids lied all the time. Oh, I'm about to go spend the night at such and such as house. I'm going to be over here, but I'm really over here. Kids just lied all the time. You know what I mean? She probably got dropped off by an older cousin or a friend. And the VMAs... um, you know, those type of events, they use seat fillers. And they do that in L.A. for, like, different award shows. And so sometimes they'll grab people off of the street if they need people to fill seats. So a lot of times people will come to these events in hopes of getting picked to go inside. And I believe that's what she thought. And so once she didn't get in, she's like, well, plan B, let me see what these limo drivers are talking about. But when you're 13, you don't think things all the way through. You're a child. You know, she just wants to party. And again, she was growing up in the same era that I was growing up in where celebrities were everything. You know, we didn't, there was no Twitter. There was no Instagram. Now, a lot of these celebrities, we see that most of them are losers. They have low self-esteem. They're always looking for validation and attention. But back then, you didn't have as much access to celebrities. The only thing you really knew about them is from, you know, perfectly curated interviews that were on television or from teen magazines. You know what I'm saying? So you you thought that everybody that, that was famous or that was on television or in a movie were good people. You know, how else would they get there? They had to be a good person. You know, they've been blessed. Look at them. They're acting in some of the best movies. They're making some of the best music. That is how you looked at things back in the 2000s. So I can see her being, you know, starry-eyed and just wanting to meet a celebrity. She came all this way 
And this limousine driver really set her up for the okie doke. And for this to happen to her is just extremely disturbing. Very, very disturbing. So it's a lot going on right now with this whole situation. Like they want to see what you allow, what you cool with. And then next thing you know, boom, take that drink, you're drugged. Take that, you're out of it. Take that pill because everybody was off something. But you had to be being in that environment many, like that. How many people were at this event? Uh, like hundreds. Even when it was a certain amount outside, but in the house was really crowded. You know what I'm saying? And you would think that, like, it was, yeah, it was more people in the house. And you walked around? Yeah, I walked around for about five minutes. I seen what I needed to see. And I was like, no, ma'am. No, sir. Because it was like selling your soul at that house. And if you like that, it's nothing to you. But if you're not like that, you're going to feel uncomfortable. And then it's like, at first I used to think P. Diddy was like, so he like rep he always talk about team love and all of this stuff. Like he's all about, you know, he all about sex himself. And I know sex because I've dealt, you know, I've dealt with men, Mark. So I know when somebody is trying to lead you on to stuff and sitting back acting like he just this macho man. And he is a charmer, though. That's one thing. Like, he will charm the fuck out of you. But for me, that's so game tight. I'm like, I know what this is. And I'm ready to get to the music. Like, if that's the case, you should have been like, don't tell me you're about to change my life and da da da, -da. And, Oh, have you been writing? Oh, that's nothing to you. He was like, have you been writing the songs that um, I've seen been telling you to write? Because the prince wanted me to write out all the songs I ever made in my life. I said, without the beat? He's like, yeah, just start writing songs. So you never know. They'll take my music, drug me. Fuck me, do whatever, and just throw me away, basically. Or after you have something on me, when we do do the music, you have that on me that this happened, and now I'm blackmailed or some shit like that. So, <sighs> touching all on me at that party, even the rapper who touched all on me, like, that rapper was cool. Like, I was liking that rapper. But when they were like, hey, you, and doing all that, what can I do? All I could do is just say, like, move his hand, like, oh, I'm fine, but, you know, trying to, like, still be cool. But I'm like, why do everybody feel comfortable to just touch on you? Even P. Diddy, like, why do you, why I look up and you're right there? And then, like, in my face, like, are you, like, in my house? Like, look, like it's weird. Like, looking at him is like when you're a kid and you're getting in trouble by your parent and you can't look them in their face. And it's like, a demon. I'm telling you, like this dark spirit, like he possessing you as he's looking at you. That power, that control. So I'm like, I read the art of seduction, motherfucker. I know what you're doing. And you're trying to really seduce me right now. And oh, take a drink. Oh, no. Do this. Do that. Go on there. Like it's just not nothing. And I want to know why me go in the house and why not the girl? So now you're picking and choosing. You have it on page 105, and you said, in many ways, I was in the same spot as Biggie when he signed with Bad Boy. I was in a, a poor cat who hadn't finished high school, but I had musical talent. Puff was rich. Puff was a rich cat with no uh, musical talent, but also with a stable of mostly white advisors and lawyers who taught him how to put voodoo on his artists. And you went and said, yeah. he went on to say that after Biggie signed the contracts that Puff forced on him, for example, he walked away with only 25000 to avoid people finding out just how broke Biggie was when he was killed, Puff announced that he was giving the Fallen Stars family several million dollars, but if he had given Biggie a fair contract, Biggie would have had plenty of money to take care of his family forever and wouldn't have needed Puff's one-time charitable donation. That's a very, very powerful statement. I was like, wow, you pretty much said that, you said well, everything Everything we all pretty much uh, thought or we had heard. To come with the receipts, you know, and show you guys what was actually in these lawsuits. Um, like I said, it was five of them that were filed. I couldn't find the fifth one. And he says he has a lot more dropping this week. Um, a few hours ago, Diddy's attorney filed a motion to try to get these lawsuits stopped because it's supposedly ruining his reputation and it's going to make for a more biased jury. I don't know how that's going to turn out, if they're going to allow it to go through the courts, if they're going to toss it out. But um, yeah, y'all, this is just really, this is sad. It's really sad and it just it can't stop, won't stop. So I want to know y'all's thoughts on this entire situation. Let me know what you guys think about this. I'm sure this video will be demonetized, so hopefully you guys will be able to have access to it and be able to see it. 
But most of my Diddy content is getting demonetized. So just letting you guys know that in advance. But um, thank you guys so much for tuning in. I look forward to reading y'all's comments down below. I will talk to y'all later. Have a good day. Deuces. If you want the latest news in the streets, join us sentiment in for the tea. Breaking news with integrity. So sir, your friends and your family. It's the lovely T T V show. Bringing you good tea and good vibes. It's the lovely T T V show. Be sure to share, like, and subscribe.